Okay, we're ready to begin. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the morning sessions this morning uh, as part of our conference on the art of inclusion. Uh, this afternoon, we have a panel called The Voice of the Artist, and we'll have a range of practicing artists who will be sharing with you their expertise as practitioners in their fields. Um, and we will be shortly going to that panel. Um, before we go there, just again to acknowledge the support of EASPD, ENCC, and COPE Foundation in bringing this conference together. Um, and thank you for attending. Before we go to the panel, I just want to also remind you that Tonight, we will have a performance from K Wheel Dance, who are based in uh, Korea, and they will be performing at 8 p.m. Central European Standard Time, and we will have a performance from them. So please bring a glass of wine, a beer, a Coke, or whatever it is that you want to bring, and share that experience with us. But also today, as well as hearing from the voices uh, of the artists that you will hear from, we're going to have a performance as well this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the panel moderator, Chris, representing the ENCC here today. Over to you, Chris, and thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Owen, for the uh, introduction. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a volunteer for the ENCC, and I would also uh, very much like to welcome you to this panel, voicing the uh, perspectives of disabled artists. Um, we talk a lot about inclusive arts practice, myself included, but seldom from lived experience. So it's exciting to be able to listen this afternoon to five distinguished artists talking about their work and their career and sharing their views on what needs to be done to support the artistic work of people with a disability. Normally, we would have met in Cork and we would have ample time for this discussion. Now we have to condense it to a session of an hour and 20 minutes. So instead of a creamy cappuccino, we are serving you a shot of espresso as we kick off this panel. Before starting, just some brief reminders. This uh, session uh, is recorded, as you know. Please be sure to uh, switch off your microphone to avoid background noises. There is captioning. If you like to use it in the toolbar underneath, you click on closed caption, and there you uh, click on show subtitle. And from there, Normally, everything would go uh, as uh, smoothly. We will take questions after the presentations. So please use the chat box to write down any questions, any remarks you have for the speakers. And we will group and address them at the end of the session. And now, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Sarah Beer. She's an actress, a performer, and I have to look at my preparation here, National Officer for Performance Art and Creative Word at the Disability Arts Centre of Cymru in Wales. Please, Sarah, take us to your wonderful artistic world. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks um, to Owen for the invite to be here this afternoon. It's a great privilege and I'm just really sorry we're not all having a lovely time in Cork, um, but it's it's great to be here. Um, I I'll, I'll just go a bit about um, my history, where where it all started, um, and then please yeah do ask questions because it's a bit a bit of a gallop through really. Um, so I always wanted to perform. Um, I did lots of amateur dramatics in school and afterwards. I applied to drama school, but they told me there was no point training me as I would never get any work. So I had to go off and do something useful, which turned out to be a business studies course, which was quite useful. Um, 
But a few years later, a friend introduced me to Grey Eye Theatre Company in London, the first professional theatre company for disabled, physically disabled performers. Um, so I moved from rural West Wales to London and discovered disability art and culture. I had come from a very small area, so where I felt very accepted, my disability wasn't an issue, um, but it was wonderful to discover this culture and movement um, that I really felt I belonged in. And, and in those early days working with people for the first time who really understood that you had good days and bad days um, and needed things to be done slightly differently because everyone was in the same or similar situation. So I trained on the job and have very much kept learning um, for the last, it's now what, 33 years, I think. Um, so I, I mainly performed in productions in London that highlighted the barriers faced by, by disabled people uh, when simply trying to live a life like everyone else. And um, the work was, I mean, with, with Grey Eye, it was very much all disabled performers. And then I worked with other companies, um, especially when I moved back to Cardiff, where I was um, the sort of token disabled performer, if you like. Um, when companies were trying, were starting to be inclusive. Um, but I, at that point, I, I wasn't ever cast as a disabled character. I just happened, like so many other um, disabled performers, have always been, you know, you can only play this particular character because it fits in with whatever your impairment is. Um, I was also very involved in the disability rights movement, which really was led by disabled artists. Um, we would tie ourselves to buses during the day to campaign for accessible transport and then go off and do a cabaret in the evening. And it was, um, yeah, it was a very important part of um, my life as a, an artist and activist. And I've kept that side of the work going. Um, I worked with various organizations um, and then got to know Disability Arts Cymru a long time ago and, and been with them in different guises for a very long time. Um, and I've been lucky, it's a part-time post, and I've been lucky that my performance, performance work has been able to um, go alongside my work within Disability Arts Cymru. And since 2009, um, I've been extremely fortunate to have worked with playwright Kate O'Reilly and director Philip Zirilli on several occasions. Kate's series of D monologues are hugely influential within dis the disability arts movement uh, and a total joy to perform, giving as they do voices to as many hidden disabled people as they do and telling stories in a, in a different way. Um, I was also fortunate to perform in two of her productions of Cozy, the first in Cardiff and uh, the second in Cork with the wonderful Gatecrash Theatre Company. Um, last year, it seems so much longer ago since the world has changed so much, but um, that was a huge delight to spend time in Cork with Gatecrash. Um, but the highlight of my career um, so far is uh, the one woman show I collaborated with Kate and Philip on in 2018, Richard III Redux. Kate had a long time thought about the idea of a one woman show about Richard III from a disability perspective. Um, and I have the same impairment as the historical Richard. Um, we didn't want to do a production of Shakespeare's Richard III um, because that's that's been done with disabled actors. Um, 
And what, what Philip and Kate created was a playful and irreverent response to um, <clears throat> Richard's portrayal, both through Shakespeare's text and through the actors um, who have embodied him, viewed through a lens that is female, disabled and Welsh. The piece looks at the historically and anatomically incorrect Shakespearean version, which arguably reinforced the twisted body, twisted mind trope. Um, it was a challenge. I hadn't done a one woman show before, um, but it was enormous fun. And it's a piece I really love performing. I played more than one character and we mixed up Shakespeare's text with Kate and Phillips re-examining of how non-disabled actors have portrayed Richard. The historical story of Henry VII's march through Wales to the Battle of Bosworth and a slightly autobi autobiographical story <coughs> of the disabled actor longing for um, decent roles. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the production toured Wales initially but we have since been lucky enough to perform at festivals both in Germany and Spain, and we're really hoping to get back to a festival in Madrid next year, if the situation allows. So, <clears throat> where are we now? Um, at this exact time, discussing the arts is actually very difficult when so many people have been so horribly badly affected by the pandemic and disabled artists are more than ever in isolation. But hopefully we will come through this and because there have been huge improvements over the last few years in the provision for disabled people within the arts, we need to try and be positive. <clears throat> As Chris mentioned, my day job is with Disability Arts Cymru which is a, the National Organisation for Disability Arts in Wales. We're based in Cardiff, uh, where I live, but we have officers throughout the country. Um, so our main aim is to uh, support disabled artists and provide showcasing opportunities for their work. We cover all art forms um, and we also offer access advice to theatre companies run uh, partnership projects with organisations like uh, Literature Wales um, and then we offer disability equality training for arts organisations. We're thrilled that we have recently received funds from the uh, European Cultural Solidarity Fund to run a partnership project with organisations in Ireland, Sweden and Portugal and we're very much looking forward to starting work with that with our European partners uh, fairly soon, I hope. Um, <clears throat> we very much follow the social model of disability, which is something that um, recently has become more and more important um, for organisations to adopt. And we're really pleased in Wales with how many um, arts organisations now do follow the social model and um, we feel as though we're very much making inroads in, in with people's understanding of the importance of the social model. So um, yeah. thankfully there are now more training opportunities for disabled artists but it's still an area that needs a lot of work not only in ensuring courses and colleges are accessible but also in empowering young disabled people to consider a career in the arts. We need teachers and parents and career advisors to stop telling young disabled people that the arts is something they should do as therapy or as a hobby. <clears throat> there are hundreds of very talented disabled artists out there who could and should be working in the creative industries. Professionalizing disabled artists is still very difficult for all sorts of reasons, but for a lot of disabled performers, it's due to the benefit trap and finding people who really understand this is often a challenge. Things are improving, but again, very slowly. 
Um, it's encouraging that more disabled writers are now being asked to write for mainstream productions, both for theatre and TV. And this is ensuring that more disabled actors are cast as characters not defined by their impairment. The UK Commissioning Programme for Disabled Artists Unlimited is really making inroads into venues, finally considering programming work by disabled artists and seeing it as work of really high quality. Um, but again, we need to give young disabled people the knowledge of and confidence to train in jobs like programming. <clears throat> there is still so much needed to be done in providing training opportunities for disabled people and for them not to be discriminated, discriminated against because of their age. Because there are now more career opportunities, disabled people in their 30s and 40s and even older would love to enter a profession that was once completely closed to them, um, but have the problem now of being told they're too old to benefit from many of the opportunities that organizations are beginning to offer to younger people. Article 30 of the UNCRPD is vital, but it is also, I feel, very achievable. One thing the pandemic has taught us is how we can all adapt to using technology to communicate with each other when we need to. The technology is out there for all organizations of all sizes to enjoy access to cultural materials in accessible formats to enjoy access to television programs, films, theater, and other cultural activities in accessible formats. To enjoy access to places for cultural performances on services such as theaters, museums, seminars, etc. What is stopping this from happening are the people who run the organizations not seeing how access provision often enriches everyone's experience. Disabled people and their organizations need to ensure that they really know Article 30 exists and how powerful it could be. And those that are in a position to need to demand that it is adhered to when entering into contracts with education establishments or venues. Sarah, I have to be very rude, but I, I will have to ask you to, to like come to a closing because <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm not, Matthew will tell you, I'm not very good with time. I've got one sentence left. All right, um, okay. <laughs> um, disabled artists create work that does enrich society. And we need to ensure that we are in pivotal positions across all art and cultural sectors so that our voices are heard, ideas embraced, and society moves forward together on a road to equality. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Sorry, that was rude for me. And no, seeing as you have to put like more than 30 years of experience into like an eight minute speech, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a challenge, but um, there was so much rich um, insights and experiences that it, for me, it was worth every second of it. So uh, thank you very much for sharing this. And uh, uh, maybe we can get back to you uh, at the end of the session with uh, questions or remarks, Please feel free, all of you, to use the chat um, if you have anything to ask or add to Sarah's story. Uh, next up, moving from the world of the theatre to the world of cinema, is Matthew Murphy, a film director and scriptwriter working with Cope Foundation in Cork. Is a um, uh, it's a, you're playing like a, a match, a football match in your hometown. So uh, please, Matthew, take the floor and, uh, and tell us about your work in Cork and the surrounding areas. Yeah, all of Cork behind me on this one, but thank you, Chris. So hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Murphy. And as Chris says, I'm a filmmaker and an actor and a photographer, and I'm based here in Cork. I work as a filmmaker and video editor with Shusha Inclusive Arts Co Foundation. And I've worked on many projects with Shusha Inclusive Arts over the years. One of many projects is, of course, for this very conference. I was part of the creative team and working on the Flavor of Cork videos. I hope you are all enjoying them as I enjoy being a part of them. And it's a great honor to be here today. 
Now, I went to college and I studied film, TV, and video production at St. John's Central College for two years. Uh, here, I've learned my craft and to become a filmmaker. Uh, it also taught me the importance in working in a team. And from this very college course, I have made many connections within the film industry. I've worked from time to time with different production companies based in Cork. So, and I even have my own production and media company called Matthew Murphy Media and Film. I, I personally think it's a very creative name and plus it's an easy Google search. So let's move on. But as a filmmaker, the benefits of working in film is I get to work with so many different types of artists just to create one art form in film. Now, to create film, people think it's just a bunch of actors and a camera, but really there's so much more from costume designers, special effects artists, lighting, sound, even music creators and composers, and that's just to name a few. Now, I'm also a scriptwriter. I have a passion in writing short stories as I wrote a short horror screenplay just last year called Axeman. Yeah. Uh, and it was screened at the Spook Screen Film Festival just last year, and it was great to see my work up on the big screen. I've made a few documentaries over the last few years. Documentary is quite different from general filmmaking, as you really need to capture the natural expression of the topic that you're documenting. As over for the last few years, Cork had a great parade called the Dragon of Shandon that goes on every Halloween. I documented this play over the last few years, captivating the participants and the audience's reaction. And as I mentioned before, I'm a keen photographer also. Now, to me, I believe a photograph is one that communicates and touches the heart that leaves the viewer change as a person for seeing us. To me, that says it all. And don't worry, you get to see some of my photos in a bit. For me, I love creating through the lens. I love taking the image freezing the moment reflects how rich the image truly is. That's what I think photography really is. And I'm here today presenting with this Arts and Disability Conference as I myself has a disability. And that does not stop me from feeling my dream to be an artist. It's great to have so many artists like you all here coming here today, communicating, sharing their experiences and working in this mad, mad world of the art world but it truly is a great world. And even in this dark time, our lenses is what's connecting us to a camera, be it FaceTime, Zoom, and any other platforms to give us the freedom in communicating with one another anyways. And as artists, I feel like we need to keep creating. We need to keep inspiring others to do the exact same. For that, I say stay safe, stay connected, and stay creative. Now, I do have a bit of time left, hopefully. So I'm um, seeing is believing. So I'm going to go do some screen sharing just to show myself. Here, here I am, a, a rare, decent, good photo of myself, of course. And here is just the cover of uh, my short film I mentioned before of Axeman, which I tend to direct and it was made into spook screen. Uh, my beard looks majestic, I'm aware. Um, and it was an absolute fantastic experience seeing my film up on the big screen for all to see. And of course, here is a few photography shots I took around Cork. Now, as Owen said before, it's a real shame we couldn't have you here in, in Cork to be here. But I hope these photos will actually get you a good taste of what Cork, the beauty of Cork really is. And hopefully to push you further to come down to Cork and enjoy all these sites. Good for flower shots and flowers, of course. And of course, here I am, Matthew Murphy, Media and Film. Uh, now, underneath is my website, and underneath is my Instagram and Facebook, where you can see all my work. You can contact me anytime for a general chat, work, or any queries, mainly for work, because I'm a starving artist at heart, unfortunately. And of course, my email, that you can email me at any time for the exact same reason. Now, to show you a moving image, here is, as I mentioned, the Dragon of Shandon that goes on in Cork every Halloween, uh, organized by the Cork Community Art Link and both Shusha Arts and Cork Foundation gets involved. And I had a chance to really document every year. So here is just a test of what you can see hopefully soon on Halloween time in Cork.
I did not expect the whole video to be played, but there you go. But um, so that's exactly the taste of what I do. That's the exact taste that I'm very passionate about. And I hope this very convinced you to come on down to Cork again. And um, again, I'm a filmmaker and you can contact me anytime for any work. And I wasn't just saying this as part of the speech, but we need to stay creative. We need to keep communicating and we need to stay safe. Because as artists, we need to inspire others. And I hope to inspire possibly other filmmakers down the line. And uh, thank you very much for having me on this conference. And, um, and I hope you enjoy my little spiel for the rest of the last few minutes. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your uh, wonderful work with us your, uh, and your story uh, as well. Um, and giving us a taste of cork uh, uh, as you were at it. So that is also another nice uh, plus. Thank you very much. And I hope we might get back to you as well. Um, um, through the power of this, uh, of our lenses, uh, we can now get in touch with uh, the, uh, Elise Patterson, who lives and works in Boston in the United States, and who has founded and is running her own uh, dance company, uh, Abilities Dance in Boston. So please also, uh, Elise, thank you for joining us. And uh, please share us about um, uh, some more information about your work, your career, and what you think needs to be done uh, to, uh, to get this wonderful work uh, out there. Uh, you have the floor, Elise. It's uh, all yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to hear what's happening uh, internationally, um, but my name is Lise Patterson. Um, I'm the founder and executive artistic director of Abilities Dance, and um, actually have a little presentation that I'll share. Um, but uh, and that's one of my dancers. Um, but a little bit about my background. Um, I am a disabled dancer. Um, I didn't grow up disabled, so I've been dancing since I was four off and on as my mom could afford uh, classes. And when I became disabled, I didn't think that dance was an option for me. So I actually went in the sciences and um, fun fact, uh, in my science days, I actually sailed from um, Massachusetts in the States to Cork, Ireland. So I'm actually familiar with um, how great uh, Cork is. Uh, but yeah, so I did some research internationally, but um, wanted to find my way back into dance. And so um, when I um, was back in Boston, didn't feel like there were spaces accessible for me or um, teachers and choreographers who were willing to work with me. And so um, I created my own space. Um, and so Abilities Dance is a uh, Boston-based nonprofit dance company using art as a tool to promote intersectional disability rights in the greater Boston area and beyond. Um, on the left is a picture of some of the dancers in our performing company. 
And those are um, not just dancers and choreographers with and without disabilities, but um, musicians and composers, the costume designer who creates our human and mobility aid costumes and more, um, and a whole te team of folks who um, make their work accessible and have these diverse identities within and outside of the disability community and really using that as a great um, representation on stage that Boston hasn't seen before, um, as well as just having conversations. And then on the right is actually a picture from our um, community engagement work where we um, do either movement workshops or lectures on a variety of topics and really hope to increase equity in conversations, whether that means uh, talking to um, Girl Scouts about including disabled girls in their troop to um, having conversations with Fidelity Investments and talking about how accessibility lessons are applicable to corporate America. Um, so the real goal is to use both of these programs to um, really highlight equity um, and building a better community uh, in Boston and beyond. And currently here in the States, there are limited means of participation in the arts, because while we have made some strides here, there's still- uh, Sorry, sorry, Elise, can I just interrupt you for a small moment? On behalf of the captioners or the interpreters, can I ask you to slow down the pace a little bit so they can really uh, caption all the things you're saying, uh, uh, if you don't mind me asking. So sorry, thank you. Um, so I'll just repeat that last bit. <laughs> um, so there are currently limited means of participation in the arts. Um, while we have made some strides here in the States, there are still um, very limited means of participation. Um, there are some that are um, educational um, slash a lot of barriers in place to have access to education. Um, and that can uh, relate to limited professional pathways into the arts as well. Um, and those biases um, can be in teachers as far as not willing to teach us um, or physical barriers where um, classes might not be in an accessible place for students. Um, and then that can kind of uh, limit potential um, professional work in our community. And so how can we ensure Article 30 of the UNC RPD is um, really um, highlighted and used to the fullest? Um, I think there should be better teacher training um, as far as welcoming diverse students and being able to support them, um, funding opportunities for schools and professional companies focusing on teaching or paying disabled artists um, so that there is um, pay for the work that we're better pay for the work that we're doing here um, and being able to support that work um, enforcing through funding requirements or fines that there is access for audiences um, as far as um, in uh, theaters or um, cinemas or uh, whatever artistic medium there is um, better uh, access here because there really isn't a lot of um, things like Carter sign language and audio descriptions here in the States and a, a lot of different uh, fine arts uh, mediums. And then proper media attention to artists with disabilities so others know that there's a feasible pathway for them um, and having adequate um, and responsible uh, representation in media so that um, people can be inspired by that work and know that that is an option. And I can repeat anything, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. And um, just, uh, uh, Elise, just wondering, um, do you also, um, do you get opportunities to show your work and is it in like in the mainstream venues or do you have to present your work in like specific festivals or specific um, types of uh, venues of, for, um, can you, Elaborate a little bit more on that, please. Yeah, um, so we have, um, for the most part, had to produce our own work um, up until the past year or so where we've started to get some collaborations with different venues like museums and things that people are starting to understand the work and starting to want to collaborate and support that type of work, um, not just with us, but with others as well, which is really exciting to see in the city. Um, but exciting to know that um, there are spaces for us. <laughs> All right, great. 
thank you very uh, very much for uh, for uh, sharing uh, your work and and um, and the, or, uh, the the organization you have built from scratch and still are building from scratch so that's wonderful to to see um Moving over now to Simon McEwen, who is a visual artist um, and also is a professor uh, at the MIMA, if I say it correctly, School of Art and Design at Teesside University in the United Kingdom. Simon, talk us through about your work and your career. The floor is yours. I'm just checking if that's shared correctly. Yeah. yeah. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for um, inviting me here today to your conference. Um, so my name is Simon McEwen. I'm a professor of art at MIMA School of Art and Design at in Teesside University. I'm a practicing artist and over the last 12 years I have exhibited internationally artworks which respond to the experience of disability. Thank you again for inviting me to the conference. Um, so I wanted to mention that I'm a disabled artist. I've broken over 145 bones. I'm deafened. And in the, in the pandemic, I've been shielding because of a heart condition. I would say that my schooling was very poor because of my um, impairments, but the art kind of rescued me and made me. The social model of disability underpins my approach to art making. My practice often develops from the combination of the fields of art, technology and disability. I have actually worked at the highest level of creative technology on computer games. And for me, disability can be described as a collision with normative preconceptions, which often need to be ingeniously managed and resisted. These experiences ranging from dark humor to outright damage and in some cases, indeed death. Perceptions of worth are unnecessarily placed by an ableist society on people with disabilities. My response has been to expose these perceptions digitally, as in this work, Ghosts, or as in next project, Motion Disabled, which you saw just there, sorry. Our cultural institutions have, despite their civic remit, found it acceptable to follow a, norm a normative agenda at the highest level. And whilst they may have provided a ramp, they, may, they have not historically and genuinely involved people with disabilities in the cultural foundation of their homes and cities. Some key, pro some key projects involving people with disabilities have, do, do, however, stand out, such as Prometheus Awakes in London in 2012. I argue that disability is a unique lived experience and one that should inform art making. It's central to the human condition. The creative inclusion in adult education project coordinated by COPE Foundation Island stated that we are convinced that the work of people with disabilities deserves public attention and that the market for existing supply is far from saturated. There are still a lot of people that can be attracted and amazed. Today, I want to talk to you about two of my projects, Cock Ignite and We Are Still Here, St. Helens. Their method of operation and how they address these points and why perhaps we are at the point of change. My aim was to create a creative journey with a community, one that is often ignored and disparaged and considered not worthy of being listened to, utilizing high value technology and collaborative practice. to dominate creatively with this com community, the ablest city centre with a projection event considered to be of high value and high status. How did we do this? Ambition was critical, thinking big architecturally and politically. As a team, we sold the idea to key agencies in the city, including the city managers themselves. We built a big inner audience, which was critical, a community of supporters and enablers who carried, in the case of Cork Ignite, the project, 
when my illness caused a full year's delay to it. Working with key agencies such as Cork in Cork and Buzz Hub in St Helens, we established core teams of disabled artists who wanted to be involved and over, over a longer period of time. Ambition created more ambition, and so the selection of a huge city centre cent building in the centre of Cork, for instance, or in St Helens, became a focus of excitement for everybody in the inner audience and not something to be scared of. I use state-of-the-art methods, including 3D scanning and accessible workshops to generate collaboratively with the teams a wealth of creative material. This material was then uplifted to make it digitally capable. I just want to play a video, which I hope you can see. So if you can just bear with me while I, I share a different screen. Apologies. Sorry, it's not working. I'll come. I'll play you the video at the end. Are there? Sorry. Um, I've just got to stop that and share my screen again. Workshops provided the, the creative context for the participants to express their own agency with the material generated later synthesized into massive out, the massive outdoor work you've just seen. These events were opportunities for communities to reimagine themselves to become culture makers of the highest order. I devised the overall concept and directed the process, but we did it together. Why? Having agency and a voice is a central tenant of life. Why? Because difference is better for society. Why? Because art matters and diversity in art is critical. And why? Because I wanted to honor my friends. Lastly, why? Because I believe in Article 30. Article 30 is the right to participation in life. The projects created cultural and structural change within Cork and within BuzzHub. They are, uh, they are exemplars to follow. Future recommendations. Many institutions are now trying to enact important structural change. It may now be easy to challenge the nature of civic inclusion. People with disabilities have nothing to apologize for. 
It's not about a level playing field. It's about achieving an equitable field. Be bold, be ambitious, and take artwork to the people. Work of people with disabilities deserves public attention because, as the report by Cope said, the market is far from saturated and the mainstream will be attracted and amazed. Uh, that's <laughs> my talk finished, and, and I just wanted to thank everybody for listening. Do get in touch if you want to know more information. My email and website is there on that final slide. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for sharing that uh, of, of some very powerful image, not only of the end result, but also of the, the making of and the process and the kind of involvement that you have achieved in, um, in, in your way of working. So uh, it was very inspiring to see that. And I would love to dwell on it more, but we have to get over to Finland to meet up with Marco. I hope Vuoren Haimo, oh my God, uh, better known as Seinmark, um, who is a, a, a performer uh, and uh, who has uh, who has been standing uh, while the most of us have been sitting through this uh, session. He has been standing through this uh, session. Marco, please uh, uh, show us or tell us everything about your work. Yes. So thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm not able to tell everything about my story in, in these eight minutes, but uh, so my name is Marko Vuoriheimo and my, uh, I perform as an artist, Sai Mark. I'm from Finland, Helsinki. Um, so much about my story in detail, I'm not going to share this time, but maybe some other time you will be able to uh, hear my story for a longer time because now for the eight minutes, it's not possible. Um, of course, because it's an uh, emotional story also with some really nice insights. So it could take an hour lecture to tell about how I got here. Um, as to becoming a deaf artist, when I told you that I told people that I dream about it, they didn't believe me, but, but so then I always believed in myself and thank God I did believe in my dream and achieving my dream. And against all odds and obstacles and I was able to work and now I've uh, published three albums and the fourth is coming up so be prepared the fourth album is is gonna come soon I've done over a thousand gigs all over the world uh, over 50 countries internationally I've uh, taken part in the Finnish Eurovision um, so a lot of uh, things I've done as a performing artist uh, what comes to my, my career as an artist, but uh, I, I have three different companies. So I work other fields as an artist. So the music and the becoming an artist and being an artist is really dear to my heart. But then, of course, because growing up and now I wanted to expand my field of work to other, other professions. And I've never had... Um, how could I say, a problem with my disability because I've, I've always seen possibilities. And I, I know that there, there are things that are difficult, but I, I'm able to change them to possibilities and positive things. So I have three companies. The first one is Signmark Productions. And uh, in here, I'm, I'm working with my music and video production. Uh, for example, I've, I've done some translations into sign language, Finnish sign language or international sign. And uh, this is something that I wanna work with the uh, government officials and companies here in, in Finland or worldwide. So for example, if someone wants to make their uh, internet page accessible, they, they can use it here. So I, I use the studio a lot working on that. So Signmark production is um, uh, where I work also as a lecturer, a most motivational speaker. I've done uh, speeches in companies, schools, different places. So this is in, in my, my lecture, I wanna motivate people. I want to show that through cooperation, working with people and believing in cooperation, you can use as a strength and uh, 
believing in what you're doing, you will get results. And, um, and what is important is that you can always achieve your dream. And that's something that I want to motivate people working towards. So Sanmar production is also a uh, working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've worked now for 10 years with the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've been to different conferences, um, uh, giving speeches in different events. And it, it's been a really nice and wonderful experience to tell people about my story and share my experiences. And usually, uh, really often people ask that, what is your dream? And uh, and I, today I say that this, this is my dream that I'm doing right now. I am, I'm able to give my, my time with, to people and be with people. Uh, the other company is uh, Mireal. Uh, I have 20 sign language interpreters working with me and uh, we are giving services to deaf, uh, hard of hearing, speech impaired, uh, deaf blind and different groups. So we offer sign language and interpreting services. And the third company is Chapla, which is now highly important because of the corona. Uh, we, I have invented a mobile application that you can have an interpreter in your pocket all the time. So if you need to make a phone call to you or you need to call me, I have an application in my phone and we can talk directly. I don't need to run to an interpreter. I can have an interpreter on my phone. Mm, so I'm 42 years old. I have three kids. I play ice hockey. Huh, okay. And to sum up, uh, what I think now traveling all over the world and seeing different people and I, I can see that things are getting better. And uh, for the last 15 years, what I think is really nice is that the disabled people have started to work on their uh, life and give their experiences, try to make things better. And I can see that it's, we can see results. I can see the hard work that we're doing. We're, we're getting results. Uh, we have more and more possibilities and we, we, are, we are able to do art. For example, different, different disabled people, they are so talented in different fields of art. They are high professionals. Unfortunately, we know that we still have work to do to be at the same level as majority. So we still have work to do. And of course, in different countries, the situation varies a lot. It's really different. But what I find that is the most important is getting the information, give it, heading out, giving the information through media so that people can see us. They can see that, well, for example, if, if one day they will meet and disabled people, they, they, they're not scared about it. They've met up, they know what it, what it is. And they, I think the direction is correct that we are moving to, towards. And I've, I've noticed that if there is a person that maybe is a, uh, an official that has power, for example, they, they, if they have a person close to them who is disabled, they, it's easier to work with them when they know the field of disability. And uh, then about the Article 30, um, the way that we are able to achieve it the best way in, in the country is that the people, the de decision makers, they have to involve the disabled people in the work. They have to involve the people who the article is affecting. So we have to be working with them. So we have the information. And always we have to see further. So if, if, if the article doesn't work, so do we have in our country maybe a law that we can we can apply to and and have because I have a lot of experiences in the that we have the UN CRPD but then maybe in, in a national law they say that oh we have this law that it's it we don't apply the UN or oh, it's only a recommendation but this it's it's not enough we really have to work on high levels and also in our national level to get everything in line with the UN UNCRPD so that it we will really get what what the UNCRPD is giving us. So this is to sum up, but thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for sharing um, your uh, uh, your work and um, and also the um, 
like the 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 spirit you bring and the attitude you uh, you bring to this uh, to this panel is uh, is uh, it was very um, it was very nice to um, to hear uh, what, what struck me and the and very different um, stories that we've heard is that well a lot of you have had to overcome a, a lot of um, um, people opposing you, or, or a, a lot of uh, adversity, people discouraging you of pursuing your dreams, your artistic ambitions, uh, etc. Um, Sarah talked a bit about uh, finding a community of people who share that experience and and um, the the way um, it it helped you in. Uh, continuing your own private, um, uh, your, your own personal uh, path. But I was wondering, can you share, or the panelists, can you share some of the positive experience of people who have pushed you further and who have encouraged you to uh, follow your, your dreams, your, um, your ambition to, to become an artist and, and to uh, develop yourself as an artist? Who pushed you forward? And how can we have more of those kind of forces? Um, would anyone like to share an, an, one of those experiences? Simon? Yeah, um, I think one of the interesting things that I'm sure all the panelists would agree is it's actually about, you can sometimes meet a, 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 a person who's a, a gatekeeper in effect. Who, who realizes the strength of your activity and pushes you forward. So, so for instance, um, that working with um, Mary McCarthy in, in Cork was, uh, was really interesting. It's, this is somebody that Owen is familiar with as well, and Matthew, and she was inspirational in, in driving forward the ambition of a project. And once she connected with the project, she was able to treat that project and, and has, as she would any other project, and she fully connected through the city of city of Cork with it, um, and I think for me it's it's about sequentially meeting people like that who are the gatekeepers who can really enable people, and and we've seen it in earlier discussions as well today that the, the pivotal role of the curators and the gatekeepers who who can either decide to keep disabled creative people out of that culture or, or actually can say, well, actually come in. And I think, and that's why I highlighted the, the court report as well, is because the end of that report, the, the little statement said, let us in because people will be amazed. And I think that is the, the critical situation that it isn't that we're trying to beg to be part of that culture. We are part of normal culture and we've got a great mm -hmm. deal to offer and we've got strikingly different experiences. So therefore we make that culture bigger, stronger, more interesting. Okay. So we have already two elements. You have a community of like-minded artists that can support you. You have these gatekeepers, people in powerful positions that can uh, choose. They made the choice to let you in, not out of pity, because, because they see the potential of the, the work um, you're making. Um, any other experience of people, organizations, uh, structures supporting you along the way? Um, Sarah, I've seen, uh, or Matthew, Sarah, uh, Matthew, you, uh, ladies first, if you uh, agree yeah. with me on that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about the importance of mentoring, um, especially for disabled artists like myself that didn't receive any traditional um, training. Um, having someone who really sees that you have got a talent and then is prepared to mentor you um, is a huge benefit. And, and I think now there's, a, there's an awful lot of established disabled artists who, um, who are really happy to provide that mentoring for um, emerging artists. And, uh, yeah, and I think the way forward is to, find um, organizations that are also happy to um, have a disabled person within their organization um, 
on a you know can be on a very sort of loose part-time basis but just having someone there who fits in with the whole staff um mm -hmm. to say right this is what you need to do this is what we find this whatever it might be whether it's about access or um mm -hmm. or staff attitudes um it, that is a a hugely beneficial and i know lots of organizations are trying to set up um, men um mentoring programs and uh, they really do benefit okay um before i go to matthew i would just like to um bring in a, a question of one of the attendees um who asks um to which extent is professional support helpful um is specialized support still useful and connecting it to to what you were saying do i understand it correctly sir that you say you need with even within a mainstream if if i could use the word in a mainstream organization you need some specialized um uh, skills from lived experience uh, pro professional support but it does not necessarily have to be in like specialized settings or specialized organizations you need specialized support but not necessarily in a specialized organization do yeah. i yeah, yeah that's, that's right yeah okay does any other of the other panelists um would like to add anything to that spe specific question um marco here yes um uh, connecting to this topic, but uh, what I would like to say at this point, I'm I'm really happy to be here now, um, to be here in Finland, because I know that we still have a lot of things that we could improve and make the the country more accessible. But traveling the world and seeing the different situations that we have all over the world, it's a, it has given me an understanding that I I'm able to appreciate what I'm getting from. From Finland, and because I we have daycare, sign language daycare. I've I've got gotten an education in sign language, and I've studied at the university uh, in sign language, and I have interpreting service, and it's offered by by Finland government. So I think I I get free service interpreting service from from my government, and then I'm able to meet up with my hearing friends, and when I meet up with them, and they. They see me as the same as everyone else. They don't because they they just they are interested in uh, through music, and that's how Simar came up because I was alike with others. And I, I think this is, has given me a perspective that it has a lot of effect how the government the attitude is towards disabled people okay. and how they want to work with different groups of people. So, so through uh, that, I've I've learned. Sorry. I understand that if the if the if the government takes away a lot of structural barriers, and in your case it's sign language, but I think for others it be like mobility or education or other structural barriers, then the the, the playing field is already much more uh, equitable for all people to participate and as a person you you don't have to overcome these barriers to interact with others um thank you very much for sharing that um before i go to the next question matthew can you share with us who or what supported you or helped you um in pursuing uh, your career yeah yeah yes of course now of course i'm a nerd so i'm going to quote a video game by this but uh I do believe that greatness does come with comes from small beginnings. I do believe that. And before when I decided to go down the path of filmmaking and want to get education, I had plenty of people in my life supporting me, even with my own disability, like family, friends, uh, even acquaintances would actually give me that push, that encouragement. And when I actually got into the field, the one type, the few type of people that really kind of pushed me to, uh, to pursue what I want to pursue is when I got on the actual film production field itself as working as like a production assistant or when I was working as a camera assistant, um, I actually learned uh, from these group of filmmakers, these group of artists on how passionate they are in this field and how determined they are to winning to get this, you know, um, perfect art form out there. Mm -hmm. And that's when I found out actually, just when I finished uh, college was, um, 
you need to start making your own film. You need to start writing. You need to start producing. You need to be your own boss. You basically cannot wait for anyone to say, can you start making a film? You need to be your own boss at the end of it. So it's you to push yourself. And you need those type of like experiences to really uh, help you to give that extra kick uh, to, to really wake you up in some way. So I believe it's yourself. You need to really know, okay, I need to get started on this type of art form, be it in film, be it in dance, visual arts, uh, writing, any acting, anything else. It's You need to be your own voice in some way, as in just sit down, get to work, and hopefully you might make something out of it. If it turns bad, if it turns awful, okay, you, you learn something from it. But mm-hmm. go back on it, and even if it turns just okay, work from there. Okay. That's what I always believed in. Okay. Um, moving to a, a next question. You are, all of you, much, in many ways, self-made, or you have made it your own. You are entrepreneurs. Um, but I, I have also a question here, uh, considering people with, like, learning difficulties, um, or um, um it might be harder for them to make their own way or to uh, create their own opportunities. They, they do. They might need support in order to do that. And maybe Simon, may I go to you? As I had the impression that you worked with uh, people with uh, learning difficulties in at least one of your uh, projects. How, how do you see the this um, this? Um, uh, what is your point of view comparing it to your own uh, situation and this and the impairment? I think it's really important to um, to be a listener. I think the most important thing is when you're working with with people with learning disabilities is that they you, you yes they may need structural engagement to allow them to facilitate the creation of culture and to take part in culture. You know we we need to act, we accept that. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't be very, very good at listening to what it is that they want to ultimately talk about, to present, you know, to to really let let them express themselves. But that can be quite slow. It can be something that must take place over months. But ultimately, there's no reason why the the work that is generated should be seen as other. And and I know there's a there's a lot mm-hmm. of situations where art by people with learning disabilities are it's kind of seen as other and presented as other. And what I try and do with my work in, in St. Helens particularly, but also in Cork Ignite, is to actually say to people, well, yes, the, yes, people with learning disabilities need structural assistance, but there are ideas, their emotional ideas, their stories, their life stories are just as valid. And you just need to take the time to listen and then to go through the processes of pre- representing that work to the mainstream. Okay, and in in your work, is it? We saw great visual work projected on the wall of that building. Is it important for you in any way that the spectators know that it was partially created in cooperation with learning disabled artists? Is it important to get that message out there, or do you prefer that their work is? It, that it's not known, that it's not been mentioned. If you look at, in the presentation, when I actually mentioned my my friends, um, you know, honouring my friends, one of the images there is um, a group, the core crew, who were people who contributed music, but also visual ideas to the overall project, wearing core crew T-shirts, and they animated the crowd, and they put the 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 whole thing for me is developing. Um, what an American artist calls the inner audience and an outer audience. The inner audience is, is vital. So the, the people there who, who helped contribute to the project, their friends, their family, they're the people who, who then connected with it, transport the project from point A to point B and make it so powerful. For me, the acknowledgement of full accreditation, full visibility, full involvement is critical because okay. otherwise, otherwise you're just a professional moving into an area using these people and moving out and as a disabled mm-hmm. person these people are my colleagues my friends this is you know and and of course i want to valorize their work as as as, as, as a huge part of the overall thing it was a 
complex collaboration in idea generation, not necessarily in terms of technology, but a very complex collaboration in the development of ideas within a very complex group in both in both cities. And I think that that's a really interesting experience. And mm -hmm. it just demonstrates that you can work with really diverse groups and present really mainstream work that entertains mm -hmm. and puts, in this case, disabled people really at the center of that. Mm -hmm. Literally, also at the center. <laughs> um, I was wondering, Elise, if if you're still there, um, I don't know if you work also with um, people with learning uh, uh, difficulties in dance, because sometimes it's said that the language of dance is a, is also a very good language to include uh, people with learning disabilities. I don't know if you have any experience in that. Um, not necessarily learning disabilities, but those who identify as having different mental um, disorders, such as um, anxiety, bipolar, et cetera. Um, and just really trying to work with folks and make a conducive space for them to engage and to create um, and doing whatever adjustments I need on my part to mm -hmm. do that um, and make that a space for them to be able to work and play. Mm -hmm. And th that's an interesting point. I think you made there, um, uh, along with all the other uh, testaments, the, the importance of a space, a space where people feel free, feel comfortable, feel safe. Can you elaborate a, a bit more on, the, on what are the char characteristics for you of that kind of space that really gets the best out of people? Yeah, it really varies person to person, um, but it can range from um, the, the basics of as far as making sure the space is fully accessible and functional um, to having space to be able to talk about current social issues that might be on people's minds that might be affecting them um, and having that kind of um, mental blocks, so to speak, uh, when you're creating um, to um, being able to just have space in general to discuss anything and everything that might come up in the process. Um, and with all of that, um, just being mindful of whatever um, people might need access wise or just as a person um, and connecting with them uh, to create. Okay, and um, maybe we have still time for some final uh, remark. Um, uh, the, the question of education, uh, you also mentioned it, uh, Elise, the importance of have, um, having teachers who are sensible, who are able to create those uh, uh, spaces. Um, I, I'll ask it to you, but I'll open it up to all the, the panelists uh, regarding the education system and uh, the education opportunities. How do we get uh, the our message across to them. Do we have any experiences with, uh, with that, any positive or other experiences? So I don't know if you or any other, um, uh, Sarah maybe, and then, uh, okay. Uh, Sarah, please uh, join us for, uh, what, what's your experience on um, educating the educators? Yeah, just that it's, um, it's taken quite a long time to get into, certain establishments. Um, we worked a lot with the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama here in Cardiff. And um, I think this year they, they're training their fourth ever disabled actor. And considering they've been going for, you know, a very, very long time. Very long time. Four really isn't, isn't great. Um, so, the, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. And it is, it is about, um, you know, creating work that you can then get people to come and see. Um, it's, it's all sorts of joining the dots so that eventually um, things change. But I'm just so jealous of um, Marco's experience in Finland where, you know, deaf people over here would so love the opportunity to be educated in sign language and it just you know it, it isn't on still isn't on the agenda okay. in most places which is just really sad okay talking of which uh i think and I, we are we running a bit over the schedule time but i hope 
uh, nobody will mind because we have saved some um, uh, some performance for last. I first would very much like to thank all the panelists for their very inspiring contribution. Uh, and uh, I would now like to give the floor to uh, Sign Mark, who will use the language of art and also the language of sign language to bring us another way of communicating experiences. Please, the floor is yours.